two ghost towns once stood where Highland Park is today. The first one died of natural causes. The second one was killed by our old friend Walter Gurney. The story starts in the 1840s when some enterprising settlers started building a small industrial port city called St. John's about where Fort Sheridan is today. They built a long pier, but no one could get there by land. The nearest road was a quarter mile away. Within a few years, St. John's was abandoned. In 1853, Port Clinton was established just south of St. John's. The developer, Jacob Clinton Bloom, built a pier and connected it by a plank road to Half Day Road. Soon, he had a successful port shipping lumber and grain to Chicago. But when Walter Gurney ran his railroad through town, Port Clinton was doomed. Gurney insisted on putting the station near his own property to the south. That's why downtown Highland Park is here today, and Port Clinton is gone. As I mentioned earlier, Walter Gurney had a vision for the North Shore, and it wasn't in lumber and freight shipping. He envisioned the commuter suburbs that we know today, and he set about to make his dream a reality. He sold 12,000 acres to a developer who started building homes from designs found in pattern books. In the 1890s, wealthy Chicagoans turned the lakefront areas of Highland Park into a sort of summer retreat. They built large homes and country clubs. In 1900, the glamorous Hotel Moraine on the lake opened, adding to the aura of Highland Park as a summer resort. But historian Michael Ebner writes that Highland Park was always more middle class and inclusive than some of its other North Shore neighbors. The most obvious example of that was that Jews were welcomed here, or at least not excluded. In 1901, four Jewish families built a cluster of summer homes and a clubhouse here and named the resort Wildwood. Since Jews couldn't join most country clubs, they built their own, which attracted more affluent Jews to Highland Park and Glencoe. Sears president Julius Rosenwald built a huge summer estate near Ravinia in 1912. At one time, he was Chicago's richest man and biggest philanthropist. He founded the Museum of Science and Industry and gave enormous sums to Jewish and African American causes. By the 20s, homes were winterized and Highland Park became a year-round commuter suburb. Highland Parkers loved their ravines and bluffs and hired prairie-style architects, including Frank Lloyd Wright himself, to design homes that harmonized with nature. Wright's Ward Willett's house was built in 1902, six years before his landmark Roby House in Hyde Park. It was his clearest expression yet of the prairie style, with its low horizontal lines and its connection to its natural surroundings. In the 20th century, Highland Park embraced modernism. This beautiful home from 1959 by Ernest Grunsfeld III not only foreshadowed the future of design, but also of North Shore real estate, because an earlier mansion was demolished to make room for it. Today, the teardown phenomenon is widespread and causing controversy all over the North Shore. The most extreme example, according to one local realtor, was a 1920s lakefront home in Winnetka purchased by a dot-com millionaire for $12 million and demolished. When the technology bubble burst, the owner sold the vacant lot at a $2 million loss. Many suburbs are now working on laws to discourage teardowns or at least limit the size of the homes that replace them. The acclaimed Steppenwolf Theatre Company started in the basement of the Immaculate Conception Church School in Highland Park. Founders Gary Sinise and Jeff Perry graduated from Highland Park High School in the early 1970s. During the summers, they put on plays here with actors they met at Illinois State University, including John Malkovich and Lori Metcalf. The company moved to Chicago in 1980, and many of the ensemble members are now international stars. One of the most famous people on the planet also lives in Highland Park, Michael Jordan. No, that's not his address on the front gate. By the way, Jordan's former boss, Jerry Reinsdorf, is also from Highland Park. And then, of course, there's Elijah Gray. Never heard of him? Well, if his timing had been just a little bit better, he'd be a household name. You see, Elijah Gray of Highland Park invented the telephone. Unfortunately, he invented it at exactly the same time as Alexander Graham Bell. Applications from both inventors arrived at the patent office on the same day. 
and you know whose envelope got opened first. But don't feel too sorry for him. He went on to co-found the Western Electric Company. Ravinia, just south of Highland Park, started as a Baptist religious colony, but it was annexed to Highland Park in 1899 and became something of an artist's colony instead. Maybe it was the wild terrain that attracted painters, sculptors, writers, and architects like landscape designer Jens Jensen. Julius Rosenwald and others hired Jensen to preserve the rustic beauty of their property. Jensen's use of native plants and natural terrain became known as the prairie style of landscaping. Jensen also liked Native American council rings. One can be seen in Jens Jensen Park across from the train station. The Ravinia Festival with its classy concert season would seem to fit right in with the arty atmosphere of the town. Some of the world's greatest artists have performed here, from Arthur Rubinstein and Yasha Heifetz to Igor Stravinsky, Leonard Bernstein, and George Gershwin. But Ravinia Park wasn't originally a concert venue. It was an amusement park built by the Chicago and Milwaukee Electric Railroad. It opened on August 15, 1904. Advertisements called it the highest class amusement park in the West. Alcohol was strictly forbidden. Attractions included baseball diamonds and grandstands, an electric swing, a casino and dance hall, and a toboggan slide for wintertime. Classical music came to Ravinia two years later with the New York Symphony conducted by Walter Damrosch. When the railroad went into receivership in 1908, a group of North Shore citizens led by Louis Eckstein bought the park. Eckstein introduced an era of fully staged operas featuring the greatest stars of the age. Ruth Page was the choreographer. During the Depression, Eckstein paid $200,000 out of his own pocket to cover the park's debt. He said, some people have a yacht, I have Ravinia. The Depression economy finally did close down the park in 1931, and Eckstein died in 1935. But his friends reopened it in 1936 as the Ravinia Festival, summer home of the Chicago Symphony. In 1949, the original pavilion burned, but the show went on. Concerts were held in a 33-ton canvas tent designed for B-29 airplanes. A new pavilion, seating 3,200, was built in 1950. The Ravinia Theater, now called the Martin, is the only original building still standing. Architect Peter Weber mixed arts and crafts and Spanish styles with beautiful art glass and prairie-style details. The 1970s brought rock concerts. Janis Joplin's performance for 25,000 fans put an end to loud rock music at Ravinia. And jazz has always been a mainstay, too. Benny Goodman, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie all performed here. More than 600,000 visitors enjoy Ravinia every summer. We're in the Skokie Lagoons now. Feels like a real back to nature experience, but actually these lagoons are man-made. The word Skokie is Native American for big swamp, and that's what was here until the 1930s when the Civilian Conservation Corps drained the land and dammed up the Skokie River to create these lagoons. During the Cold War era, there was a Nike missile base on one of the islands in the lagoon. By the way, we 